In the book of Acts, we read about an unstoppable group of people, the early church. It was the only time in history when Christians were being taught directly by the apostles, people who walked with Jesus in the flesh. They were teaching original Christianity. It was pure. It was untainted. And the stories that we read about the early church make these people seem almost alien because they were so unlike all the other people around them. They were so different than everyone else. Most of us today, we read these stories in our Bibles and we try to push away this nagging question. Why don't our lives look anything like the book of Acts today? Why does the church look so different today? Now, sure, maybe some of us try to convince ourselves that our lives do look a little bit like that, that we experience the power of God sometimes and that our lives are changed too. But honestly, if we're being really honest, we can't actually remember a time when we saw thousands of people get saved at the same time. Or the last time that we were a part of a community where people were actually sharing everything they owned and no one had any needs whatsoever. What we call Christianity today, it's just not the same kind of Christianity we read about then. So what happened? What's wrong? And what do we do about it? These are the questions we're going to be addressing in this series, Dead Church. We decided to call this series Dead Church for the same reason that Jesus called the church of Sardis a dead church. Jesus says, I know what you do. You have a reputation that you are alive, but really, you are dead. I have found that what you are doing is less than what my God wants. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. What did Jesus mean by dead? Jesus uses the word dead to describe people who call themselves Christians, but they're on the verge of being rejected by Jesus. Because Jesus continued in his letter to the church in Sardis by saying, you must wake up or I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So according to Jesus, if a Christian thinks that they're alive, and if everyone else thinks of them as alive, but in actuality they're dead, it means they're not actually a Christian at all. Jesus is saying to that person, when I come like a thief in the night, I'm not going to be coming for you. I'm going to come against you. So you need to wake up. Essentially, he's saying, you think you have salvation, but you don't. Because according to many passages of scripture, a person is dead before they're joined to Jesus. For example, Paul said, in the past, you were dead because of your sins and the things you did against God. Yes, in the past, you lived the way the world lives. Though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did against God, he brought us to life with Christ. 
A person is dead before they receive the life of Jesus. And they are alive after being brought to life with Jesus. So, if a person is calling themselves a Christian, but Jesus is calling them dead, Jesus is saying that that person's deceived. They think they have life, but really they're still completely dead and without true hope. A dead Christian is not a Christian at all. A dead Christian is only deceived into thinking he's a Christian. Okay, Jesus is saying it's possible for a person or an entire church to think that they're alive, to think that they're Christians, to think that they have life with Jesus, to think that they're saved when in fact they're still actually dead, dead in their sins, without hope, without Jesus, and without salvation. Think about the implications of that for the church today. Think about the implications of that for yourself. If it's possible for people to think that they're alive, but actually be dead, to think that they're Christians, but not actually be Christians, to think that they're saved, but not actually be saved, then it is so extremely important that we identify how to know the difference. Because everybody thought the church in Sardis was alive. That was their reputation. But Jesus thought they were dead. So clearly, everyone had the wrong definition of what it means to be alive. Everyone had the wrong definition of what it means to be a Christian. So, what if that's true today? What if the church today has the wrong definition of what it means to be a Christian. We named this series Dead Church for two reasons. First, because we live in a place and a time in which the Western church has a reputation of being alive. But like the church in Sardis, what if everyone has the wrong definition of what it means to be alive? What if Christians today are deceived? What if, for whatever reason, Christians today don't know what it means to be a Christian? Because according to Jesus, you can be dead and not realize it. According to Jesus, you can be dead while being fully convinced that you're alive. What if that's the state of the church today? What if that's you? We wrote Dead Church to address some of the ways that Christians today have the wrong definitions, ways they think they're alive, when really they might be dead. Secondly, we name the series Dead Church because when Jesus wrote to the church in Sardis, he didn't leave them without hope. He told them to wake up. He told them to repent. He told them to overcome and that if they overcome, he would not erase their names from the book of life. In short, he told them that there was something they could do about it. It wasn't too late. They still had a chance. And we wrote Dead Church because we want to see a dead church come alive. We want to see them wake up. We want to see them repent. We want to see their names written in the book of life. But in order to help a dead church come alive, we have to figure out what it means to be alive in the first place. To be able to help a dead church mature and become all she's meant to be, we have to first figure out what's wrong so she can change. In order to recognize how a dead church is dead and how she can come alive again, we have to recognize what scripture teaches. Not just individual verses here and there, but as a whole. We have to recognize the fact that the Old Testament provides us with examples that are warnings for us who live in the church age. 
the whole concept of having a reputation of being alive but actually being dead, it's not unique to the people who lived in Sardis. The entire Old Testament is filled with examples of people like that. And as Paul said, the things that happened to those people are examples. They were written down to warn us. So what does the Old Testament teach us about thinking we're alive when we're actually dead? Well, in the Old Testament, while giving the law to the nation of Israel, Moses gave the people this sober warning. He said, I know that after I die, you will become completely evil. You will turn away from the commands I have given you. Terrible things will happen to you in the future when you do what the Lord says is evil and you will make him angry with the work of your hands. This verse is just one example out of many throughout Deuteronomy chapters 28 to 32 in which Moses repeatedly warns the Israelites that they are going to turn away from God. In these chapters, Moses gave a very clear warning to the people that one day they would fall away from God. They would reject him. And as a result, God would drive them into exile. It's this incredible warning to read because it's exactly what ended up happening to Israel over the course of the following 800 or so years. Moses warned them. He warned them ahead of time. He warned them what they would do. He warned them what would happen to them. The nation of Israel had the warnings from Moses with them every day right there in their own nation's law, they were being told that the time would come when they would turn away from God and that he would punish them as a result. How did they let it still happen? Well, contrary to what a lot of Christians think, the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah did not see themselves as people who had abandoned God. A lot of people don't realize this because the Bible is written from God's perspective. We read God's words about all the evil things they are doing, and we just assume that their evil actions were as obvious to them as they are to us when we read about them today. But that was not their perspective. Think of it this way. If I meet a man who's five feet tall, will I think he's short? Yes. But will a three-year-old think he's short? No. A three-year-old would think he's tall. We have different perspectives. The Bible is written from God's perspective. And when we read it, we can clearly see that the Israelites were coming up short. But if we read between the lines and we look at the actions and the responses of the Israelites, we can see that they had a different perspective. They thought they were tall. The people themselves thought they were obeying God and worshiping him. They thought everything was perfectly okay. They did not see themselves as people who had rebelled against God or abandoned him. In other words, they thought they were alive. But God said they were dead. Here are some examples. The Lord says, I do not want all these sacrifices. I have had enough of your burnt sacrifices of male sheep and fat from fattened cattle. I am not pleased by the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. You worship me. But who asked you to do all this running in and out of my courts? Don't continue bringing me worthless sacrifices. I hate the incense you burn. I can't stand your new moons, Sabbaths, and sacred assemblies. I can't stand the evil you do in your holy meetings. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. 
They have become a burden to me, and I can no longer tolerate them. When you raise your arms to me in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you say many prayers, I will not listen to you. Notice the things that the people are doing in this passage. They're bringing their sacrifices to God. They're worshiping God. They're keeping the new moon feasts that God told them to keep in the law. They're keeping the Sabbath that God told them to keep in the law. They're having their sacred assemblies that God told them to keep in the law. They're having holy meetings. They're keeping all of the appointed feasts from the law. They're raising their arms to God in prayer. Does this sound like a group of people who have fallen away from God? When you think of the rebellion of ancient Israel, is that what you picture? This is the biblical description of the people who killed the prophets. We tend to picture them sitting around casually carving wooden statues and randomly calling them gods. We picture them as blatantly ignoring everything Moses wrote, refusing to pray to God and refusing to bring sacrifices to him. That's not what they were doing. These people were still worshiping God. They're still bringing their sacrifices. They're still keeping the feasts and the Sabbaths. They're still meeting together. They're still praying. But God says he hates what they're doing and he won't listen to their prayers. Here's another example. The Lord says, shout out loud. Don't hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people what they have done against their God. Tell the family of Jacob about their sins. They seek me every day and delight to learn my ways. They act just like a nation that does what is right, that obeys the commands of its God. They ask me to judge them fairly. They want to draw near to God. They say, why have we fasted, but you didn't see? Why have we afflicted ourselves, but you didn't notice? But the Lord says, Look, you do what pleases yourselves on these fast days, and you oppress your workers. You cannot do these things as you do now and believe your prayers are heard in heaven. Is this the fast that I want? Do I want a day when people afflict themselves? I don't want people just to bow their heads like a plant, stretching out on sackcloth and ashes. Is this what you call a fast? Do you really think this pleases the Lord? Notice what the people are doing in this passage. They're seeking God every day. They delight to learn his ways. They act as if they're people who do what is right. They act as if they're people who obey God. They ask God for just judgment. They want to draw near to God. They fast before God. They pray to God. They bow their heads to God. This is the description of Israel at the height of their rebellion, at the height of their apostasy. They were not people who thought they were in rebellion. God's perspective was that they were evil, which is what we're so familiar with. But their own perspective was that they were seeking God. They were delighting in Him. They were drawing near to Him. They were fasting to Him and they were praying to Him. They thought they were people who do what is right. They thought they were people who obeyed God. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, even the storks in the sky know the right times to do things. The doves, swallows, and cranes know when it is time to migrate. But my people don't know what the Lord wants them to do. You keep saying we are wise because we have the teachings of the Lord. But actually, 
Those who explain the scriptures have written lies with their pens. We see here that they were reading the teaching of the Lord and they believed it gave them wisdom. Over and over, if we look for the perspective of the people about to be judged, we can see that they didn't realize they were disobeying God at all. This is a theme we can see all throughout the prophets. When we read the writings of the prophets, we can see clearly the people thought they were following God. In Jeremiah 21, when Nebuchadnezzar was attacking Jerusalem, King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah in order to receive a word from the Lord. He wasn't someone who thought he'd rejected God. He was wanting a word from God. In Jeremiah 14, 14 to 16, and in Jeremiah 23, 16 to 32, as well as in many other places, we see that Israel was full of false prophets. And yes, Christians understand that Israel was full of false prophets, but those false prophets were all coming in the name of the Lord. They were telling the people that they were sent by God and the people thought they were following God. And we see in many of these stories that even the false prophets themselves actually thought they were true prophets of God. We see in Jeremiah 26, 7 to 9, that the people wanted to kill Jeremiah, not because they hated God, but because they thought Jeremiah was speaking evil against God. Jeremiah had said that the temple of the Lord would be torn down they thought they were defending God. We see in Ezekiel 33, verses 30 to 33, that the people were coming to Ezekiel in order to hear what God had to say. In Hosea 5, 6 to 7, the people are worshiping God and bringing him sacrifices. In Amos 5, we see the people claim that the Lord is with them, and they're excitedly looking forward to the day of the Lord. Okay, so... Over and over, throughout the writings of the prophets, we can see the people of Israel were still offering sacrifices to God. They were still getting advice from God's prophets. They were still keeping God's feasts. They were still worshiping at the temple. They were still praying to God. They were still fasting to God. They were still singing songs to God. They were still reading scripture. They were still looking for a word from God. They were still listening to prophecy. They were still prophesying and many other things like these. In short, the people did not recognize that they had turned their backs on God like Moses had prophesied. The people had a reputation of being alive. They thought of themselves as alive and in close relationship with God. But really, they were dead. In the end, God judged the nation. He drove them into exile. He allowed his own temple to be burned to the ground. Moses had warned them about this when he gave them the law. God warned the people before it happened by sending some of his own prophets to them. They had warnings. They were told it was coming. And yet, despite all of this, the people were shocked. They were caught completely off guard when Jerusalem fell, when thousands died, when the temple was burned to the ground and the survivors were led off into exile. And somehow, despite all the warnings, no one saw it coming. The God they thought they worshipped came against them unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. This should be a sober warning and example for us in the church age. Because just like Moses warned the people of Israel about their apostasy and their exile long before it happened, Jesus and the apostles wrote similar warnings to the church. Paul said, Brothers and sisters, we have something to say about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the time when we will meet together with him. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. That day of the Lord will not come 
until the apostasy happens. The word apostasy was a Greek word that was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint. It was used to describe the actions of Israel during their rebellion. For example, in the Septuagint, in 2 Chronicles 29 and 30, Hezekiah, who was one of the good kings of Judah, said that their fathers were apostate and that they did what was evil before the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles 33, the actions of King Manasseh were called apostasy. Furthermore, the word apostasy was used to describe the actions of the Jews who rebelled against God during the time of the Maccabees. The word apostasy or apostate essentially means falling away or fallen away, respectively. Paul is saying that the day Jesus returns will not happen until the church falls away first, just like Israel did in the Old Testament. His original audience would have understood what he was saying because the word apostasy to them referred to Israel rebelling against God. And Paul is saying the church has to do this first before Jesus is ever going to return. And he wrote other similar warnings too. Now, the Spirit clearly says that in the later times, some people will abandon the faith. They will follow deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. He also said, remember this, in the last days, there will be terrible times because people will love themselves, love money, brag and be arrogant. They will say evil things against others and will not obey their parents or be grateful or be holy. They will not love others, will refuse to forgive, will gossip and will not control themselves. They will be cruel, will hate what is good, will turn against their friends and will be reckless. They will be conceited, will love pleasure instead of God and will act as if they serve God but will not have his power. Avoid those people. It's important to note here that when Paul gives this description, he's not saying the world will be like this. That's what a lot of Christians today tend to think. They tend to think that Paul is saying this is what the world is going to look like in the last days and it's going to be terrible. But Paul's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. He's saying that this is what the church will look like. And we know this because he ends his description by saying, avoid those people. And in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul clarifies that when he says to avoid people who do certain things, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about those in the church who do those things. So Paul is saying that in the last days, it's going to be terrible because the church will be full of people who love themselves, who love money, who brag, etc. Paul is saying the same thing here that he's saying elsewhere. Apostasy is coming. People will abandon the faith. And there are many other warnings just like this all throughout the New Testament. Jesus warned us about it. Paul wrote about it many times. Peter wrote about it. The entire book of Jude is filled with these warnings. The point is this. When Jesus and the apostles established the new covenant, they warned us. Just like Moses warned the nation of Israel, Jesus and the apostles warned us that the time would come when the church would fall away from the truth. And just like we tend to read the Old Testament and not recognize that it's written from God's perspective, we also tend to read the New Testament and we just assume that their warnings are something we're going to easily see when it happens. For example, we read the book of Jude and we never consider, what if Jude is describing me? What if that's God's perspective 
of my life. Or we read Paul's warning that I just read about how in the last days, it will be terrible times because people will love themselves. They will love money. They will love pleasure. And we never consider, what if I'm that person who loves money? What if I'm that person who loves pleasure instead of God? Just like Israel in the Old Testament, so many Christians are aware of these verses. And they think it means people will be aware of the fact that they're no longer following God. But that's not what scripture warned us about. The New Testament writers repeatedly warned us that people would be deceived. By definition, if people are deceived, that means they don't know. If people will be deceived, that means that when they commit this apostasy, they'll still be going to church. They'll still believe in God. They'll still be reading their Bibles. They'll still be praying. They'll still be singing worship songs and many other things like these. Just like Israel in the Old Testament, their perspective will be that they are serving God. But God's perspective will be that they have committed adultery against him, apostasy against him, and that they have completely abandoned him. Very few Christians recognize the example in the Old Testament. God warns his people that they will fall away and that it will result in destruction. He gives them very clear warnings, but despite all of this, the people don't recognize that they already have fallen away. They don't recognize that the apostasy has already happened. Convinced that they're serving God, convinced that they're just fine, they surround themselves with false prophets and false teachers who tell them what they want to hear. Despite all the warnings in scripture telling them that people will be deceived, they still assume that they would know if they were committing apostasy. Very few Christians recognize another lesson from the Old Testament. The apostasy committed in Israel in the Old Testament was not a minority of the people. In other words, the apostasy was committed by the overwhelming majority. It was such a vast majority that Elijah honestly thought he was the only person left who truly served God. Jeremiah describes himself as sitting alone. The New Testament warns us that it's gonna be the same way with the church. A lot of Christians might think that the apostasy is only that particular denomination over there, or these Christians over here who've accepted some new teaching, but that's denying what scripture says. Paul said the times will be terrible because so many people will be apostate. Jesus said, you'll be able to recognize a false teacher simply by seeing if they're widely loved. Jesus warned us that few would find the path to life, but the apostles warned us that many would be deceived. The pattern in scripture is abundantly clear. God works with a minority, a remnant. Look at Noah. Look at Joseph. Look at Moses. Look at Joshua and Caleb. Look at Gideon. Look at Elijah, look at Jeremiah, look at the rest of the prophets. Look at the many thousands who followed Jesus around, yet he only showed himself to 500 when he resurrected. Most people will not choose to follow him, even if they think they did. Peter wrote a warning to Christians. He said, there used to be false prophets among God's people, just as you will have some false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce things that are wrong, teachings that will cause people to be lost. Peter was warning us that there would be many false teachings circling around that fool many people into thinking that they're saved when they're really not. 
just like in Israel, these false teachings would give people a confidence that they are right with God. People would be confident that they are truly saved and truly born again. But because they're believing a lie instead of the truth, their confidence does them no good. This is exactly what has happened in the church. Countless people go in and out of their church services every Sunday. They read their Bibles, they pray, they sing worship songs, and they have emotional experiences when they feel close to God. They go seek out prophecy and they themselves prophesy. But they don't actually submit to Jesus. Their lives don't change. They continue in sin and they are dead. Just like Jesus warned the church in Sardis, if these people do not repent, the day of the Lord will come against them like a thief in the night. Just like it did to apostate Israel in the Old Testament. We need to understand the difference between a dead church and a living church. Throughout this series, we're going to address the following topics. We're going to talk about false teaching. The New Testament is full of warnings about false teachers. We're going to look at those warnings. We're going to look at how the Bible says to recognize and avoid false teaching. And we're going to look at how prevalent false teaching is in the church today. We're going to address faith, repentance, and love, and how we, the church, have adopted the wrong definitions of all those words. We're going to look at how the Bible defines faith, how the Bible defines repentance, how the Bible defines love, and we're going to show how our wrong definitions have affected everything about our mindset, our actions, the way we view the Bible, and what we think we understand. In short, we're going to look at how our wrong definitions of faith, repentance, and love have, like Sardis, given us the wrong definition of what it means to be alive. We're going to talk about mainstream Christian views about the gospel, legalism, and condemnation. We're going to point out how many lies we've just accepted how many things we just assume and how much about what we believe is simply not biblical at all. We're going to look at the modern Christian life. We're going to look at all the things we think of today as what the Christian life should look like. And then we're going to compare those things to the lives of the Pharisees. We're also going to compare them to the commands Jesus gave his followers. And we're going to evaluate does the modern Christian life look more like what Jesus came to establish or like what Jesus came to oppose? We're going to look at the practical examples the Bible gives about what it really means to seek first the kingdom of God and love him above everything and how our actions clearly show us whether we're doing that or not. We're going to talk about what it truly means to abide in Jesus and when we should expect our prayers to be answered and when we should not expect them to be answered and why. We're going to look at some conditions that the Bible gives for these promises, conditions that Christians usually overlook. Also, if it's possible to think you're alive when you're not, and if it's possible to think you're a Christian when you're not, and if false teaching is as prevalent as the Bible says it will be, then Christians need a way to know the difference between what is true and what are lies. We're going to look at how the Bible tells us exactly how we can know. We're going to come back to apostasy one more time. Based on everything else we discuss in this series, how can a Christian have assurance of salvation? And how can a Christian know that they're not living in apostasy? Furthermore, how do we respond to apostasy when we see it in the church? Finally, we're going to wrap up the series with an appendix video. In that video, 
we're simply going to read through dozens of relevant scripture verses on some of the topics we're discussing so that you can see that these are things the Bible teaches consistently. The Bible is not a collection of individual unrelated verses. The Bible teaches the same things from beginning to end. In other words, these topics are things that God brings up a lot throughout the Bible. And if they're things that God brings up a lot, then they're things God cares about a lot. And if God cares about something a lot, then we would do well to pay close attention to what he has to say. This series was born out of a deep desire to see the church restored to what we see in the book of Acts. A church walking in the kind of love, power, and life that's unstoppable. A church bearing the kind of fruit that we're supposed to bear. A church that looks like Jesus. This series was written because I deeply love the church of Jesus. I love his bride. I want to see her grow out of the human traditions that are holding her back and step into maturity. I want to see Christians come to experience the true life, the kind of life we read about in the book of Acts. I want to see Christians begin to realize just how worthwhile it is to actually surrender everything and live for Jesus. I want to see Christians realize what that even means. Some of what we talk about in this series is probably going to challenge you. It might go against everything you've always thought. It might go against everything you've always been taught. It might be uncomfortable. It might even be downright painful at times. But I encourage you to go to scripture yourself. See if what I say is true. Go to scripture, read it, and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand. Because you have to know the truth. If it's possible for a person to think that they're alive and to live in a culture that has a reputation of being alive when they're actually dead, then it's possible that what you've always thought and what you've always been taught is not actually the truth. And maybe you don't have the life you think you have. I don't expect or ask that anyone take my word for it. I don't want you to take my word for it. I just want to challenge you to go to scripture and make sure that your perspective matches God's perspective. And if it doesn't, what needs to change? Please feel free to download our free book version of this series if that'd be useful to you as well. You can find that available for download at our website, www.axinitiative.com. Thanks for watching. I pray that God our Father and the Lord Jesus would bless you and teach you as you watch the rest of this series.